Hi, I'm John Cohen, and we're going to do a science live chat today about uh, should chimpanzees be studied in captivity. Uh, joining us are three uh, wonderful researchers who've all worked with uh, chimpanzees in different settings, uh, Brian Hare, Pascal Gagnon, and Bill Hopkins. You're welcome to ask questions, type them in, and we'll read them, and uh, the different researchers will address them. I think you'll find that they have interesting and different perspectives. Um, so we'll start off with uh, some questions that people already have posted. And uh, Brian, Pascal, and Bill, uh, just speak up and if you'd like to answer it. Um, one, one of the questions is the difference between laboratory uh, uh, experiments and studies of chimpanzees in captivity and wild chimpanzees, uh, which have been studied um, uh, for you know, 50 years now um, closely. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, what useful information could be gleaned from studying chimpanzee behavior in the wild as opposed to the controlled laboratory experiments? And isn't the purpose of the uh, National Institutes of Health chimp experimentation to use chimps as animal models, not to simply observe their natural behavior? Well, I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a first answer here. I, I think it's a little bit of a false dichotomy um, to set it up as... Uh, wild versus captive uh, observational or experimental research. I think there's valuable results that come from both of those settings um, that complement each other in many ways. So it's true, the, NIH, the NIH's mission isn't necessarily to, to go out and have people just watch the chimps, and uh, although there's no reason that couldn't be the case. Um, one advantage that we get out of some of the captive settings that we can better control the kinds of variables uh, that would be difficult to control or to eliminate um, in a wild setting, first of all. And then second of all, I think it's probably important to note that certain kinds of studies or certain experimental or scientific questions uh, are sometimes maybe better addressed or can be better addressed uh, by studying captive individuals instead of those in the wild. So there's just simply some topics that lend themselves to a captive setting in a slightly better manner. Pascal, you studied wild chimps in the Thai forest in Cote d'Ivoire. What do you think? Well, I think the, it, it's, it's hard to argue that uh, a captive chimpanzee, especially a youngster growing up uh, in a setting that is incredibly, can be incredibly impoverished compared to the wild, it's, that is, it's the same situation. So I kind of take the argument for, for, from people who work exclusively with, with wild chimpanzees that you know, studying development, for example, in a captive setting, you might miss the key things that you have in the wild, which is a very complex social system, a very complex 3D scaffold of forest and surprises and other living things. But I, I'd like to say a word about the modeling part, uh, because I actually think chimpanzees are so interesting, not because they're a very good model. I think in many ways they're a bad model. They are a separate realization of a hominid evolutionary trajectory. And I think that's what makes them so interesting to study them, not as a model to model human disease, but as a unique view into how hominids, including ourselves, evolved, and as a separate realization of such an evolutionary trajectory. Mm. So, Brian, you're kind of at the intersection of the two. You've done a lot of your work in sanctuaries where they're in Africa. The sanctuaries mimic the natural environment often very closely. What, what do you think? Well, the, I mean, I think that, you know, we're obviously here because the United States and the NIH is trying to figure out what the future of chimpanzee research is going to be. And I just think that the question has been asked in a, in a funny way um, again and again. Um, I don't think the question is, should chimpanzees be studied in captivity? The question is, where in captivity should they be studied? Um, and, you know, the, the way that I see it is that I think that, um, you know, Robert Yerkes, who founded the first primate center, and Yerkes, Bill works at, is named after, he wrote a paper in 1918 where he suggested that we have primate centers and bring primates to the United States, including chimpanzees and other great apes. That was before we had, you know, the ability to travel internationally, internet, telephone, etc. So I just think that we can do the exact same work that we do in the regional primate centers. Uh, we can now do it in Africa, and we can do it just as well, and we can do it for a lot cheaper. And we can make a, a big difference in the life uh, of conservation organizations that are trying to protect those animals. So I think the debate, again, I, I agree with Bill that 
you know, you need both wild and captive work. The question is, do we still need the laboratories to do the work that we want to do? And well, some are, people, you arguing, are you arguing that we don't? Uh, well, I certainly for non-invasive work, I don't think you, I don't think you really need it. Um, and behavioral work. Now, Bill can speak to it because I think this is a place where he can make the argument that to do serious neurobiological work currently, imaging work, for instance, I mean, currently we have not published anything in Africa on that. Um, but I just saw the first MRI images from, uh, from uh, the Republic of Congo. Uh, there were two chimpanzees that were put in an MRI machine in Congo. So uh, it's not impossible that in the future, if people got excited and wanted to invest, we could do it. Well, so that, that leads right into another question that someone, uh, LG, posted. Uh, there are a variety of ways of interpreting invasive uh, when discussing captive research. And for example, some suggest removing a chimp from a group and anesthetizing her in order to do a brain scan is non-invasive, or that implanting a therapeutic heart monitoring device is non-invasive. Uh, so discussions of whether captive chimps are justified seem to suggest that if research is non-invasive, it's more likely to be justified. Uh, what, what do you three think about the definition of invasive, and where do you draw the line? I mean, I saw, for example, at Yerkes, I observed a PET scan um, of a chimp that uh, had to be anesthetized for the PET scan, and it had to be intubated. Um, it wasn't harmed in any way. Was that invasive? So, so I'm, I'm happy to go first, and, and I'll just say I think a, a pretty conservative definition is if it's in the interest of the individual animal, then, you know, if you have animals in captivity, you're going to have to do regular veterinary work. And if it's in the interest of the animal, and then the question is if it's in the interest of the species, uh, then I don't see that that as being particularly uh, invasive. Um, now in the case of the PET scan, um, you know, I don't know. It, I, I don't think that necessarily hurt the animal, but I don't know if it was really in the interest of the species. It depends on how you de define interest of the species that are interested in the individual then. But, but I think if it's, if it's in the interest of the ape, if it's health research, veterinary health research, I, I'm comfortable with it. I think it's a very difficult question, obviously, and, and I doubt anybody has the answer to it. Uh, several years ago, uh, Ajit Varki, Jim Moore, and I uh, tried to you know, come up with a way to, to help find a question of what, what we would consider acceptable for research in gyms. And, and for example, uh, it turns out cerebrospinal fluid, which you only get with spinal tap, is pretty hard to get by, and that would be, you know, would this be ethical and how, you know, you're quite happy to do a study on humans where you take CSF. It's not, there is a, a very low risk that, you know, uh, bad things could happen, but it's done regularly in humans. So, you know, I would be quite happy doing things with chimpanzees that is routinely done on, on humans uh, that does not leave any permanent damage. And take that as a criterion of whether I would do this uh, in, chimpanz in captive chimpanzees or not. Bill, where do you um, I, I, I share very similar opinions to Pascal's view. Um, you know, we try to use, you know, the guidelines that are used with human subjects, and we try, at least in, in our work, we try to apply those in the questions and the kind of questions or research we're doing with the chimps. So, you know, I, I'm, I have a very similar view to Pascal's about what defines invasive. It's interesting because the Institute of Medicine committee that reviewed this and the NIH accepted their recommendation, it didn't narrow it down to what Pascal is essentially saying, which is if you could ethically do something on a human in a research, research study, you can ethically do it in a chimpanzee. Am I hearing you right, Pascal? Is that the essence of it? Well, I would add something possibly to kind of um, solidify the ethics, and, and we had initially proposed to write this, and you know, I think if you consider it ethical, you should be ready to do it on yourself. I actually think we should experiment on humans much more, and we should have the scientists performing the experiments be part of it, because if, if somebody asks you to volunteer for an experiment, and you ask them back if they are one of the volunteers, and they say no, I would not volunteer. It's kind of the basic golden rule that I was, so if you, if you do CSF studies in chimpanzees, you need human controls, you're one of the controls, unless you have some clinical that's reason not to be. That's very, that's very interesting. Bill, Bill, there's a question directed specifically to you that gets back to something that Brian raised, and the question is, why continue to study chimps in barren laboratory environments where they, when they can be observed in the wild or in more complex captive environments, such as sanctuaries? And 
why does it matter that we know which hand a chimp prefers to use? And isn't there a point where well-being and rights of chimpanzees outweigh the need to satisfy our curiosity via controlled experiments? Um, okay. I'm not sure which part of that two-part question you want me to go well, with. Let's, let's start with what, what Brian was raising. I mean, why, why the... the um, okay, well, I think in a global sense, if, whether you're working in a sanctuary in Africa or in a sanctuary in the U.S. or in a laboratory setting in the U.S., you're still working with captive animals, all right? And ultimately, and for example, in the sanctuaries in Africa, in a number of those settings, those animals are orphaned, all right? And which is really the principal problem that leads to some of the psychological issues that some of the cap captive animals might have, all right? So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that, the, that, that this idea that one setting, it, well, first of all, I wouldn't even go so far as to say that that every laboratory setting is incredibly impoverished. I do believe we should do more, everyone should be doing more to improve uh, the physical housing and the psychological well-being of all primates, not just chimpanzees, in, in captivity. We should be striving to to have um, settings that you know rival what we can have in the wild. Um, but I don't necessarily, uh, necessarily see that uh, Moving, for example, my research program to a sanctuary in Africa would necessarily get me any different results or any better results. Well, I think the point, though, that that the um, that the person was asking that Brian's making is, you could do it in Africa. So why do it um, in a setting that is not as close to the natural environment? Because, well, first of all, they're here, and the, the chimpanzees are here, and they're in other places in the U.S., and they're, they're not going anywhere. And I think it would be in many ways to just leave them sitting there and doing nothing with them, in some ways, is, is somewhat ethically questionable as well. I think we, you know, with, with the doing cognitive studies with the animals is enriching to them. And, and I think to just say, well, you know, we can do it in Africa in a physical environment we think is better and, and psychologically better for these apes. But when we don't really have any scientific to demonstrate that, uh, scientific evidence that demonstrates that, I think is, is, is probably, you know, not a good decision at this point. I think we have the resources here and it's in our best interest to sort of invest in those resources um, now um, instead of moving these operations to another continent. Brian, what do you think? Do you think that Yerkes should retire all his chimps and the other facilities that house captive chimps should retire them all? Well, I don't know about Yerkes. I mean, I can circle back to that, but I certainly think that there's a huge opportunity, and I just want to make sure that people are aware. And please go to aperesearch.org. It's aperesearch.org, and that's a website where basically um, everybody who does non-invasive uh, work that's not in a U.S. NIH-funded laboratory um, has formed a consortium, and we've posted all the publications since 2006 that we've that we've published. And I, I, I think that website's really important because what in the debate over the future of chimpanzee research in captivity, it's often been if the NIH closes their facilities, there will be no more chimpanzee research. That, I've heard that said over and over and over and over again. And so that's why we built the website was to say that actually the vast majority of research that's non-invasive with chimpanzees, it doesn't even occur in the NIH labs. And because the NIH has a big voice, they've been able to say that over and over again um, in all sorts of position papers. But what I would hope in the future would happen is there's a much more cost-effective way to do research in Africa at sanctuaries. There's over 20 of them. There's over 1,500 apes that are um, orphans of the bushmeat trade. And by supporting these organizations in Africa, we're actually helping protect wild chimpanzees. We can do the same, uh, or actually in many ways, better research uh, in Africa than we can in the labs. Um, there are some questions we can't answer currently, and I, def you know, and, and I think that absolutely that's true. Um, but there are a lot of questions that we can answer that you cannot answer in a laboratory. Just for instance, nobody has bonobos. So we have two closest relatives, not one, and because the NIH has taken a model species approach, they chose the chimp, which in many ways was a really bad decision because bonobos have uh, probably a lot of the psychological um, underpinnings that we have that are more similar uh, to many of the diseases we want to study. Um, but we chose the wrong species. 
So if we study bonobos, we study them in Africa, we help protect them in Africa, we can also help protect our own health. It's a win, 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 win. Um, just, can I just say something? Yeah, please. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to anyone who wants to go work in a sanctuary with, with chimpanzees there and, and they want to do behavioral or cognitive research. I, I have no troubles with that. Um, I, I, I really am interested in the people who want to stay here and do that work. And I think, you know, that, that you know, it's, you know, there's a lot we can do here that, that would benefit chimpanzees as well, that has benefited chimpanzees as well. And we, you know, we should be, we should be supportive of that. And the, the, the apes are here and they're not going anywhere. And I think we need to be investing in that. And, and I think there's many settings, you know, again, going back to this idea that the environments are really barren, I think there are a number of facilities in the U.S., research laboratories that are housing chimpanzees that rival many sanctuary settings. So I don't, I, I don't think, you know, it's as glorious as, as it sometimes can be portrayed. So there's been uh, cutting back on chimpanzee research for many years now in the United States with NIH funding. I, I remember when I started writing about chimpanzee research, the NIH was breeding chimpanzees for AIDS vaccine research. Um, they stopped that in 1997 or so with the moratorium. I, I wonder whether the recent events have at all impaired the research that uh, you're doing, Bill or Pascal, that, that you do with biological samples. From chimpanzees? Has it become harder? And if so, what type of research isn't happening that might be happening? And what's the cost um, of cutting back on chimpanzee research? So I, I think I think uh, it's clear that that uh, the idea that uh, we, we're pretty much done with chimpanzees. So you know, the, the thousand or so individuals that live in the U.S. If they go to sanctuaries, the males get sterilized. We end up with you know aging chimpanzees and talking about non-enriched environments, lack of youngsters would be a very big way to to make an environment much poorer, for example. But, you know, sanctuaries insist on the fact that they don't want more chimps and the next generation of chimps there. It has made it much more difficult to get to biological samples. I, 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 would, I would really support um, uh, Bill's point that I would I think it's unethical not to give the chimpanzees in U.S. sanctuaries the best possible medical care, including research because there is so much we don't know about them as I you know I, I want to reiterate that chimps in many ways are bad models they die of completely different diseases uh, than we do yet they're being treated like little humans you know you, you, using human medical books and so forth so well, I what think are some examples of that well the famous thing is the so-called heart attacks these cardiomyopathies that that kill a lot of chimpanzees they, they drop dead and it looks like a heart attack but it has nothing to do with the human heart attack it's something in the muscles, it's scar tissue in the muscle of, of these chimps. So it, it looks from far away like they're having a heart attack, but it's not at all the, the same type of cardiovascular disease that is one of the biggest killers in humans. And they actually, to, to bring biomedical difference in, uh, in the wild, of course, and that, that includes sanctuaries, you have a lot of contact between humans and the chimpanzees. So we are bringing in potentially nasty diseases to the sanctuaries and to wild study populations. And chimpanzees might react very differently, as, as has been shown for the pneumoviruses and the uh, respiratory syncytial viruses in West Africa, where there's some evidence that the very people who study the wild chimpanzees and try to protect them might be infecting them with pretty nasty viruses that are not nasty in us necessarily, but very nasty in the chimpanzees. So I think we, we really Ethically, we, we are obliged to study them more, both for their own sake and for our understanding of human origins. Bill, what, what work uh, has your work been curtailed at all? And if so, what specifically aren't you able to do that you would like to do because of uh, the cutback in funding and support of captive chimp research? Uh, well, my, my work has not been affected that much um, for the most part, but I do think that we are very limited Pascal already mentioned this, the fact that we're not breeding and haven't for a while. Uh, you know, we, we have an, you know, areas of developmental research, you know, what is the time course of brain development, for example, in relation to behavioral development and things like this. We haven't really been able uh, to do anything like this, and, and that's probably one significant limitation of um, some of the decisions that NIH has made regarding the management of the captive population. Brian, there's a question that uh, is very basic, but I think it's worth addressing because we have a broad audience here. 
And please, if you're watching, do ask us questions. What's the difference between an ape and a sanctuary in Africa and an ape and a sanctuary in the U.S.? Okay, so the U.S. has um, uh, a lot of sanctuaries that house apes that were either bred for the entertainment industry um, or a, have been taken from people who had them as pets. Some of them uh, have been collected from laboratories. Um, and Chimp Haven, for instance, is where the United States government uh, created a sanctuary and retired a number of chimpanzees, several hundred actually. Um, and so that's a U.S. sanctuary. So those are animals that basically um, are no longer um, either being used as pets in entertainment or in laboratories. And so either a private NGO has take, footed the bill or the taxpayer has footed the bill. A sanctuary in Africa is, uh, there, there are 20 of them, and there's an organization called the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. Um, and those uh, organizations, each, each of the 20, have uh, been operating as conservation and welfare organizations. There's um, a raging bushmeat trade in Africa. Um, literally thousands of chimpanzees are being killed each year. Uh, we're anybody who's worried about ape conservation in Africa is very worried about the growing uh, footprint of China right now. Uh, we know that 100 chimpanzees were um, poached, or not sorry, poached, but were, were sold to uh, the Chinese from Guinea, uh, funneled through Guinea and ended up in China. So basically there's, a, there's an organization that's trying to stop the bushmeat trade, try to stop people from uh, killing uh, endangered apes in Africa. They, they give these animals lifetime care when they're confiscated, uh, particularly when they're young, so you have a very young population. Uh, usually they're confiscated to, at uh, around the age of two to three, and they're given lifetime care, and they have um, wonderful large spaces, as much as 100 acres of primary tropical forest they live in. They live in multi-male, multi-female groups. They can forage all day, but then they come into housing at night, um, and uh, because they don't like to get rained on, they're not, uh, they're not stupid. They like to stay inside. And, and what that means is in the morning you can ask them if they want to play games. Um, and so we can do our cognitive work then. Uh, it's all voluntary. If they uh, don't want to play, we let them go out and they can live their normal life. But then, of course, they need veterinary care as well, and so we have a lot of opportunities there to collect data. And I just want to go to the biological sampling question really quickly and say that we have collected, uh, uh, we've cloned genomes of over 100 individuals. We have collected hormone assays, testosterone, cortisol, we have done um, doubly labeled water in the sanctuaries, which is a, a measure of uh, uh, metabolism. And so um, we're not just doing behavioral work. We're, we're doing all sorts of uh, physiological and um, uh, you know, morphological and behavioral work and cognitive work. So there's well, a lot of opportunity. Well, but let's, let's get to a very practical uh, aspect of this. Pascal, can you access those samples? Uh, only if I, you know, if I get my own CITES permit or work with people who have a CITES permit and you need permits from both the exporting nations and the importing nations. Is that hard to do? The, uh, it depends who you are and how connected you are. The, the, uh, for the permit now in the U.S. you actually have to prove that you directly are involved in conservation of the species in question. So if, if I'm interested in, chim in chimpanzee genomes, I have to convince the CITES authorities of the U.S. that my work will in some way directly contribute to the future um, uh, conservation, to the conservation of these chimpanzees or other apes. So just to put a fine point on it, it's, it's easier for you to get samples from chimps in captivity here than from chimps in the in sanctuary. The US. Yes, however, um, Interestingly, there is uh, CITES has now started regulating interstate traffic, even though it's really it's, it's an international convention, right? CITES, but the CITES officials in the U.S. now are inter you know would like to know if you move chimpanzee samples from one side of the U.S. to the other. So, that's, so CITES, that has added a whole new layer of uh, of permits needed. CITES is C I T E S. It's an acronym for an international treaty that uh, regu that, regu that actually stopped the importation of wild chimpanzees by researchers um, to uh, outside of Africa, or at least it tried to, and, uh, and I think for the most part it succeeded. Um, there's a question that builds off what we're talking about, what somebody's asking about, uh, Hogan is asking about Bill raising the point that we should invest more in the captive chimps here, and asks, wouldn't it be possible for there to be a collaboration between researchers 
working in sanctuaries in Africa with those working here in the U.S. to improve the captive conditions in the U.S. with the end goal of species conservation. Could more be done to have Bill and Brian and Pascal all working together with the same end goal in mind? Absolutely. I, I see no reason. And, and in fact, I mean, this is what often concerns me is that, is that you know, persons who are studying wild chimpanzees, you know, there, there becomes this sort of unfortunate barricade or there's this sort of uh, notion that somehow, you know, you know, if, if you're studying a captive chimp, you're, you're doing something less than if you're studying a wild chimp, okay? And, and I, as I, I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier. I think these can complement each other. And it, the same applies with the sanctuary situations. I think, you know, instead of some of the ideas that the working group has proposed, which is to build these brand new sanctuaries and 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 to, to spend a lot of money to do this to retire these animals, it would be we would be better served in many ways to take where we have chimps now in research settings and provide funding to those institutions to expand their facilities that they would so that they would become more close to what's in the wild or in some of the African sanctuaries. If we think that the, just simply expanding the physical space and the physical environment is enough to to satisfy those who who feel you know that really want these kinds of changes made and think it has a, a real benefit on the well-being of the animals. A, a question has come in from Roro, and please, if you're watching, uh, send us your questions. Roro apparently works at Chimp Haven, a sanctuary in the United States, and uh, asks why it has to be either sanctuaries in Africa or sanctuaries in the U.S. Shouldn't we be making the most of all chimpanzees in captivity while they're still while ensuring that they have the best environments possible, and the chimpanzees are in the U.S. for better or worse for the rest of their lives? Do you have access? To, do researchers have access to do research studies with chimps at Chimp Haven? And if so. Can you get the types of samples you want if they're biological? I mean, what are what's really available, and what are the limitations? Um, is there anyone in particular you want to answer that? I mean, well, I mean, I, I think that uh, you know, Brian, you could do research at Chimp Haven if uh, you were allowed to. Can you? Is it possible? Well, I think the the first thing is that um, the the biomedical biomedical community. Um, people who are interested in invasive research on chimpanzees to study human health, they've been very critical of Chimp Haven, and they've said that Chimp Haven has been very um, restrictive in their um, regulations of what research would be allowed. I actually don't agree with that. I think that they've said you can do non-invasive work uh, as long as it's observational in nature, and um, there's a lot of people who do that type of work, and if you're interested in elderly chimpanzees that have been released into a new environment and watching how they flexibly adapt to that new environment. If you're interested in how chimpanzees form new relationships with one another, um, if you're you know, interested in uh, how to increase the welfare of those animals, then it's a fantastic place to do research. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. My understanding is nobody has actually yet applied to work there. Um, last I spoke to the folks at Chimp Haven six, eight months ago, they repeatedly uh, I, it's repeatedly said over and over by um, actually quite high up people that I've been in rooms with when they've said it that no one could ever do any research at Chimp Haven. I, I don't understand why because on their own website there is a research application. You can go and apply. Um, so maybe people have applied and they've rejected them but I, I don't understand. But I just want to go back to the question about um, just really quickly Bill was saying about um, why can't we just all do our research and all you know um, be excited about each other's research. I am. I think Bill does great work. I think Pascal does great work. But there's reality. There's the real world. And the real world is that there's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money to do this type of work. And it's getting smaller and smaller all the time. And uh, the when you look at the cost benefit of, you know, the publication for dollar, I think you can do much better in Africa than you can with uh, mm. aging infrastructure that was built in the 60s and it was built before Jane Goodall went to the field, and I think it would be horrific if there was breeding in the United States again in the um, biomedical facilities. I think that would be uh, just a, a major waste of money because for, for the amount of money that it takes to keep animals in the United States, it's just a drop in the, I mean, it, we could just do amazing things with, with um, that money in Africa. It, just, to, just to be concrete, it, it's, you know, I've never had a penny 
from the National Institute of Health to study the great apes uh, that we work with in Africa. I've, I've gone to the NSF, and if you get money from the National Science Foundation, I can promise you, you're not getting as much money as you are if you go to the NIH and get an R01. So, so if I can go and do my work on an NSF budget, I promise you it's cheaper. Well, you know, Pascal, do you have any thoughts about the possibilities of you doing your research with samples from Chimpaven? Is it something you've explored? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I know that uh, Linda Brand, who I think just uh, uh, she she just stepped down from directing uh, Chimpaven, but she was always very open to the type of you know sample collection that is totally non-invasive, even either done during routine care. Or more importantly, actually, post mortems and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, samples collected when an animal die dies of a natural death, and and I think that brings up a, a big question where there's a lot of wasted opportunities. I mean, we have a a very strange situation in the U.S. where we have most chimpanzees that are in sanctuaries that are sterilized, and then you've got a small population in zoos that every zoo is trying to have as many babies as they can. In both cases, we end up with animals that sometimes die, and many of these opportunities are not, um, you know, taken advantages of. We, we, our knowledge of basic grade eight biology is lacking in so many respects that any passing of a grade eight should be very closely monitored, and then, out of respect of both the individual and the knowledge we would like to glean from these species, we should perform. Perfect autopsies on 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 the on the great apes that die in captivity, and very mm -hmm. often that is not happening. Is that because the institutions aren't playing aren't playing along? They aren't playing ball. They don't want to share. What, it, what's the I think there's a variety of reasons. The, the 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 simplest reason is that you know these animals die on Sundays or Christmas Eve, and 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 for a good autopsy, it has to happen immediately. Uh, many of the tissues will autolyze very rapidly. So really, what should be in, in, in place, and, and, and you know, I'm not trying to put the onus on Jim Haven. I think the researchers should step up and fund, you know, regional pathologists or people who, who can step in. And when they are told we have an animal that looks like it might die, that then every care is taken to to maximize these samples. I mean, I, I participated in in some of these collections. Uh, LA Zoo, for example, had an individual that died, uh, and he is one of the 78 um, apes that just got his genome sequence because they called us up and they said this animal is dying uh, and so we performed an immediate post-mortem and collected as many samples as we could in in best of fashion possible to maximize the the biological information and I thought I think there should be much more of that irrespective of the setting and I'm very hopeful that this is possible in Africa and Brian and I, I have had a lot of discussions I think he's totally right that the African sanctuaries are a phenomenal resource uh, but I wouldn't put it either or. I, I think you know the thousand plus apes that are here are here, and not studying them I think is unethical. So we're talking about uh, the future of research with chimpanzees, both in captivity and in the wild. We're speaking with Brian Hare, Pascal Gagnon, and Bill Hopkins. And one of the questions comes from Dan, who asks whether the recent decisions about curtailing chimpanzee research with captive chimpanzees um, will affect HIV research significantly. And I mentioned this a few minutes ago, chimpanzees were the model for HIV vaccine research for many years uh, at the beginning of the um, isolation of HIV in 1984. Shortly thereafter, uh, the virus was put into chimps and it was vigorously studied in chimpanzees for uh, until the early 1990s and that all stopped. And we now also know that there's a version of HIV, it's called simian uh, SIV CPZ, that likely kills chimpanzees from an AIDS-like disease, which we didn't know years ago. So I'm going to put a question to the three of you that I, I think is provocative, that I've thought of often. Um, when Brian, you mentioned doing experiments to help the animals. Would it be ethical to do SIV-CPZ experiments in captive chimpanzees to develop a vaccine that ultimately would help both humans and vaccines, uh, and, and chimpanzees, and bonobos for that matter, although they haven't ever been found with SIV CPZ, would that be ethical to do a vaccine experiment that would be similarly done in a human except uh, let's say you just wanted to look at the immune responses. Um, you didn't want to put SIV CPZ into the animal but you wanted to see what immune responses would this vaccine stimulate. Would that be ethical? Can I just jump in really quick and just say that um, the I think the first question would be do you have to do it on the chimpanzee or the bonobo? I mean, I'm not a vaccine researcher, 
Um, but I know that that's the first thing. You know, people who are welfare advocates, that would be what they would want to know. And, and truthfully, every U.S. researcher should be a welfare advocate. That's legally what we should be doing um, is at all times not trying to avoid uh, using animals in any situation uh, where we don't need to use them. Um, so I think that's the first question is would, can you do it using a new technique, using a different model species? Um, and once you've answered that question, if then the answer is you can only do it with chimpanzees and bonobos, okay, now we've got your question. Um, okay, let me, put, let, me, let me put a fine point on it. Here's the experiment. The way that chimpanzee experiments with AIDS vaccines were done for many years was to give them an HIV vaccine and then to inject them with HIV. And HIV, by and large, doesn't cause harm in chimpanzees. We now know because it's not adapted to them. Um, but what if you were to do it with SIV CPZ and then put the chimpanzee who became, that became infected onto antiretroviral drugs to keep the chimpanzee alive and relatively healthy? Would that be ethical? Given that that experiment would never be done in a human, and yet it might help both species. Anyone want to touch that one? Well, I, I, I can try because I, I, have, I have big doubts uh, because the, the big question is applicability. Uh, you, you would need large numbers and would you ever want to go in and treat wild chimpanzees with a vaccine that might be half-baked? Um, and I know there is some talk of possibly you know, treating wild chimpanzees with Ebola vaccines and so forth, but it's uh, the numbers you need to test vaccines in humans, are, you know, you would need more than all the, the, the African sanctuaries combined to test the U1 vaccine candidate. And given the history of human uh, HIV vaccines, uh, that it doesn't bode too well. Yeah, well, Plus, they used to be with two different SIV CPZ in East Africa and in Central Africa. So even yeah. within chimpanzees, you have quite different um, SIV CPZ strains. So I just think it's not realistic. I, you know, I think that answers the question. I wouldn't start doing it because there's no way you would have enough animals and then be able to actually go and treat animals in the wild. Well, but Pascal, the old experiments could get statistical significance with you know, four to eight animals. And the, you know, it, I, I don't know. I mean, in, in the past, that's how it was done. Brian, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I have talked to the, some of the directors in the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance about um, you know, diseases they're really worried about. I mean, we, we have animals that die in Africa of horrible things. There's a virus called EMCV that kills bonobos. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pretty horrific death. Um, and, and so, you know, there's Ebola, there's Marburg, there's, there's everything you could, could be terrified of as a person. You know, great apes can get it. As a captive ape manager in Africa, you're worried about those same diseases. Um, so when you talk to them about, okay, well, what would you do? Or if we found out there were individuals infected with these viruses, um, you know, first of all, they're interested and willing to participate in research that will um, prevent the spread, that will help us understand these viruses better. And, um, you know, if, if there was a, a vaccine that was really risky that somebody thought might work on an animal that was already naturally infected, um, I think they would go for it. Um, but I think... The idea that you would go to a sanctuary and infect one of the sanctuary apes with Ebola intentionally to then test the vaccine, that then gets really tricky. Yeah, um, I, want, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm not advocating this. It's just that in the past... That's a, that's a great question. It's what, it was routine in the past. That's what the model was for, and to do things that you wouldn't do in a human. Right. Um, Roro from Chimp Haven uh, has several comments online. I'd encourage everyone to read them. And uh, Roro, I would argue that you are part of this conversation, so I wouldn't worry about it. That's the beauty of new media. Uh, Andrew asks a question and says, the question is really asking whether it's wrong to domesticate any living thing and then study it. I, I think that's an interesting point. Bill, what do you think? I mean, do you, uh, how do you draw lines here between great apes and any other uh, species? Well, I guess I wouldn't really consider the chimps to be domesticated. In the, in the way that, say, a cow or a dog might be domesticated. I mean, they haven't been selectively bred for specific kinds of traits. I mean, they, these, as far as we know, the chimpanzees that are, are in captivity in the U.S., you know, they're all from, you know, a fairly diverse genetic pool of, you know, that came from the wild. And so I, I, I'm not sure that uh, I would say that we are really studying a domesticated animal. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't consider it to be a domesticated animal either. Um, so the um, question Roro is asking now is whether federal funds are going to be made available to care for chimps that have been used in biomedical research in this country. And we're and we're saying that these apes are living in substandard housing, and currently NIH funding for research with captive chimpanzees helps pay for their care. Um, are these chimpanzees going to find themselves in an even worse situation if NIH funding for research is cut off? Any thoughts on that? I think the answer is yes. I, I think right now, you know, in many instances, uh, the support for the animals is coming from research that's funded with them. So if, if the NIH, which is not my interpretation at all of what the IOM has, has, has uh, suggested or the working group for that matter, but I do think if they, if they were to just say, we're not going to fund another chimpanzee research project, whether it be behavior, genomics, imaging, or anything else, yeah, I think I think these animals will lose um, in that proposition. Brian, do you have any thoughts about it? You, uh, I imagine, are supportive of the of the emphasis to move more chimps into retirement and to cut the type of research funding that's been going on for those well, the studies. The reason that I didn't answer before about retirement is that I completely agree with Bill and Pascal. I think that there's no problem studying the chimpanzees that are in laboratories. Um, I just wish that they could be retired or improve the laboratories so that they're nicer. Um, and in some ways that has been done. I've visited some and I mean it's not as bad as it was before. It still could be way, way, way better. Um, so, you know, I do think there's been real efforts there to improve things, but I mean, it's uh, light years away from what it could be. Uh, so, I, so when you say retire, I mean, I think why we're having this conversation is chimpanzees used to be intentionally infected with diseases. And, and that's really what's going to stop happening. And um, all the other stuff, like what Bill does and what Pascal does, I mean, we're studying human evolution. We're trying to understand... Um, you know, laterality in the brain, which is super important, what Bill does. I mean, understanding whether they have left or right hand biases is crucially important if you want to understand language, if you want to understand all sorts of other things. Um, so if you mean by retire them that they no longer are going to be infected with diseases because there are other models that are more effective, um, then yes. If retirement means that you lock them away, forget them, and nobody takes care of them, and Bill can't go do non-invasive research, um, well, that's silly because I mean, ultimately, Bill and I do almost the exact same thing. Um, you know, but but what worries me is if literally we spend tens of millions of dollars on these chimpanzees, and we could be spending even a quarter of that, and absolutely quintuple the research that we do if we worked in another place. And I just want to be really super concrete is, and, and Bill and Pascal can correct me, but I don't, I think that, I, I don't think there's been anybody, uh, I, the only thing that's more endangered than the captive laboratory chimpanzee is the captive laboratory chimpanzee researcher. I don't <laughs> think there's been anybody who's gotten tenure. I don't think there's been any tenure track jobs. And so the only people that I know who've gotten tenure in the last four or five years have been, I have one student who just got a tenure track job uh, and I got tenure. So I just don't think there's a future uh, because of the funding situation. So I think that if, if it's just, oh, we're going to use the tiny little bit of money um, uh, to just keep doing what we're doing, I just don't, I, we will not have a field anymore. There are no students, there's, yeah. there's no one who's going to be doing this in the future. You, you know, but you raise a very interesting point. I mean, the disease research really was where most of the funding was coming from. And Correct. the other behavioral stuff, and neurocognitive stuff, was piggybacking. Totally. Um, and so now you're in a situation where the Institute of Medicine is giving direction to the National Institutes of Health, and you're not hearing the NIH say, this is an incredibly valuable resource that we want to keep supporting at the same level. They're saying most of these studies are unnecessary, or many of them are, not most, let me correct that. Many are unnecessary. And that, uh, you know, we should maybe even dwindle it down to 50 captive chimpanzees available for researchers. I mean, do you think there's a, a, a lack of recalculation of resources given the move away from that disease model? I would say yes, but I, I, I'll defer to my colleagues here. I'm certainly, I'm certainly afraid of that. Um... How about you, Bill? Well, 
I'm trying to just dissect your question a little bit. So I guess, you know, my, my view is maybe we haven't been very good advocates for what we do. Um, and I agree when, you know, I, I don't think that the amount of funding coming from NIH to support biomedical research with Jim was all that great. I, I've been, you know, in this field a long time and I think there's there's more funding available for doing chimp behavior brain genetics now than there has been in the past. And, you know, I think that's a good sign. And, and I think if, if we are, we're better advocates for what we were doing, maybe there would be more support for that. And, and, and I think there's more interest now than there was in the past. So, so in some sense, I mean, I agree that there, it's really unfortunate that, that at some level NIH is saying, I mean, I, I guess for me, I guess I haven't interpreted anything from NIH that says I don't, that they don't want to continue to fund research in cognition and genomics and neurobiology. I mean, that, that wasn't what I took away from the IOM. What I took away from the IOM report was, you know, there really wasn't a lot of support for the need of chimps in HIV or, or malaria or other forms of research with, where, where they had been historically used. So I guess I have a slightly different take on, mm. you know, you know, how the funding sort of has changed over the years. In my view, you know, given that we've done the chimp genome now, we've made so much connection, uh, progress in, in, in non-invasive ways of doing imaging, th this is the time we should be investing in, in these resources, not, not scaling back, because I think we're really on the cusp of a lot of really important discoveries that everyone participating in this ha has been involved in. Just to be clear, the NIH hasn't uh, finalized its decision yet about the IOM report and the working group that studied it for the NIH and the Council of Councils. That should happen in the next few weeks. So it's unclear, I think, still what the NIH is going to do. Brian, did you want to say something? Or? Well, I was just going to say, again, uh, the question is what resources to invest in. Do you invest in resources that cost tens of millions of dollars to upkeep every year? Or do you invest in resources that actually all you have to do is pay for the actual research itself? Um, yeah. It'll cost you much, much less, and we can do as hard-hitting um, science. And in fact, in many ways, we can do better science. You know, not only has the chimpanzee genome been done, now the bonobo genome has been done. It was not done in an NIH laboratory. It was done in Leipzig, and it was done at Lolea Bonobo because we sent a sample out. Um, so the you know there are amazing things that can be done in sanctuaries that cannot be done in the NIH facilities anymore, um, and for me, uh, I just I think that you're gonna if if we decide to maintain status of these aging facilities, you're gonna be throwing a lot of money um, uh, that you could do you could use much more effectively uh, to do non-invasive work that would help not just people but also the apes. And let me just go back really quickly to the emerging infectious disease problem is the, the sanctuaries are at the front line of emerging infectious disease prevention and um, potential research if, um, if people would take it seriously. Uh, the bushmeat trade, obviously we talked about HIV and um, where did that come from? Well, you know, one of the hypotheses is it was the bushmeat trade. Um, that, you know, people were eating primates and somebody got infected that way and then it spread from there. So we now have an increase in that trade. Uh, we have, you know, all sorts of potential viruses, et cetera, that can be in entering into populations. And if we invest in that, we could not only prevent the next pandemic, but we could help save great apes, study cognition, behavior, physiology, morphology. You get a lot more bang for your buck than you do if you just keep going with, um, you know, the current uh, setting that we have. If you could fund both, great, but I just don't think that's realistic. There's a question from Marcos. Do you think that the Humane Society of the United States is having too much of an influence over the direction of medical research in the United States? And uh, the Humane Society has advocated strongly for uh, stopping certainly invasive biomedical research with chimpanzees. Uh, do, does anyone have thoughts about that? Well, I'm happy to talk about it, but I've been talking too much, so maybe somebody else wants to say something. <laughs> I, mean, from, I, I haven't had a lot of interactions. Go ahead, Pascal. From, from personal experience, uh, when, when Ajit Varaki, Jim Moore, and I uh, wrote this paper on, on the ethical consideration of captive chimp research, we got, you know, 
massive reactions from two extreme sides. One side saying chimpanzees should have human rights and who, who were we to advocate studying them. And the other side of, oh, you're on a slippery slope, you will end up with the animal rights fanatics. And we kind of took that as a compliment and said we might be somewhere near a reasonable you know, um, position on, on, on what to do with chimpanzees. But it's almost impossible. It's, it's clear that it's a, it's a topic that totally dichotomizes people are lots of extremely loud people on both extremes. That's <laughs> I, I need my chimp brain to drill in and uh, you're a Nazi because you consider taking a blood sample from a captive chimpanzee. And that's very rapidly where you find yourself if you advocate, you know, a, a, a an increased interest in 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 following, you know, health research in chimpanzees by taking samples, but not in a way you wouldn't do in a in a normal human. Well, I I would just riff on Pascal and say that in my experience, um, uh, it certainly has been the case that. Um, uh, things get dichotomized and who suffers as a result are the animals. I think that people do not treat welfare seriously. They think that, and you see it in the newspaper all the time, you'll have somebody who's talking about welfare and they get called an animal rights activist. Um, and and if, you, if you say you care at all about welfare as a researcher, people all of a sudden think that you're against invasive research in any context under any circumstance. Um, and so I think that we need to start thinking about welfare like the Red Cross. There's, you know, there's two people battling it out about the ethics, but at the same time there's this whole thing of welfare. It's the guy who's actually putting the tourniquet on the injured individual. You don't shoot at that guy while you're fighting your war. And, and so uh, you know, I think that in many ways, um, in my experience, I think the Humane Society has been the only group um, that has been doing anything uh, that looks like welfare. Now I know that they may veer in other ways that disturb people, but uh, if there was a if there was a more moderate group, then I would be really excited about them too. But there isn't one, um, except for um, and 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 partly that's because um, there's this di dichotomy, and I would say it's at universities too. I mean, professors who do uh, super invasive work on primates, um, which you know, if it's necessary, uh, if there's no other way, I'm supportive of. Uh, they can be very aggressive if you start talking about chimpan chimpanzee welfare. Um, so I, I don't. I, for for me, I think that's the the big issue is people have forgotten there's this thing called welfare. Mm. St Stephanie uh, asks, uh, can can you name any diseases or invasive research that are still necessary? And are there studies where there's no alternative except to use chimpanzees? I mean, hepatitis C has been uh, the central model. Um, the chimpanzee has been the central model for that research community for many years, and there is no vaccine for hepatitis C. Um, what, what do you three think? I mean, is there anything you can point to that you think you make a strong argument that it's important to continue to do invasive research? I mean, my guess is that uh, that you three people don't have anything at the top of your agenda that you think is necessary that's bordering on invasive, but, but tell me what you think. Well, I, I, I'm not a biomedical worker, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. I, I, I think the people that do that work can make those arguments the best, and I think they did a, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this in the IOM meeting, and I think, you know, there were a couple of instances where uh, some cases could be made for, for the use of chimps in some research. Monoclonal antibodies comes to mind. Uh, remember specifically what that was targeted toward, but there there seemed to be some, you know, some individuals among the, the group of individuals there advocating that there is a need for chimps in some of that. Hepatitis C, I think the IOM was really split on that to me, I, or at least that was my impression from the report. Um, you know, some were advocating maybe there were some mouse models now that might be better for this, but still I think uh, some of the representatives from some of the larger uh, vaccine centers were thinking, you know, yes, we still might need a chimp or two for some of this kind of work. But, I mean, as I said, I'm not, this is not really my area, so it would be difficult for me to give a, a very informed answer. Yeah, there was a researcher I spoke with some years ago who pointed out to me that he had actually overseen a monoclonal antibody experiment in a chimpanzee that harmed the chimp, that caused serious harm, and it was about to be tested in humans. And he said, this was exactly what the model was supposed to do. 
that was preventing harm in humans at that very last stage where there was no other alternative. And his argument was, wouldn't you rather see the chimpanzee injured than a human? But I think that argument has fallen out of fashion, if not ethical sort of evolution that, that, that's occurred. But, but I'm curious uh, whether anyone else uh, thinks that. I think that you, you're stuck with, uh, I'm, I'm, do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so I think you're stuck with testing many things in humans. We are our best model animal. So no matter how many things you test in non-human animals, in, in the end you will need to test it on humans. Uh, volunteers or sometimes passively volunteered, as for example when governments vo volunteer a population. And, and, and I think that's a question that's very rarely addressed, especially by animal rights advocates, who usually don't you know, line up to, to volunteer for vaccine tests. And I think all of us have to, our, to ask ourselves that if, if we develop vaccines for humans, we can't just ship that out to Uganda or to China or to India. You know, it used to be the Swiss government volunteered its population or the Soviet Union volunteered its population. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, we, we're trying to test medication for our species that has its, u its unique trajectory, especially with regard to immunology, very different from mice and very different from chimpanzees in many ways. So in the end, you, you will have to test it in humans no matter what. And I don't have an answer for that, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, annoyed by the fact that nobody addresses the fact that in the end you will need your cohort of humans that you tested on, no matter what. So we only have a few minutes left, and I have one question for each of you, the same question. Um, the population of chimpanzees that exists in captivity now, uh, without active breeding, it will disappear. Uh, they cannot possibly be sustained. There have been several studies that have looked at that. Um, and with a date of 2031 being the end date. What's your vision of the future here for the captive chimpanzees that are here, uh, some of which are owned by the U.S. government um, and at Chimphaven? What's your, what's your vision? What happens 10, 20 years down the road to captive chimpanzees outside of the zoo setting in, in the United States, which houses more than anywhere? We should make that clear. So let's start with Brian. What do you, what do you think? What's your vision? Well, for me, I, I mean, I think that it's fine if the population goes extinct. Um, I, I don't think they're necessary. I don't think we need them for anything. I think there are thousands of chimpanzees in captivity in Africa. Um, I think that zoos have hundreds of chimpanzees, and I think we have plenty. Um, I, I'm more worried about bonobos. I think that that's where we're really in shortage, and I think that's what people, I mean, people never talk about that, but we have two closest relatives, and we have no access to bonobos. What a disaster. So for me, the future is lots more bonobos. I think we're fine with chimpanzees. Pascal, what do you think? I'm puzzled by the, the fact that a lot of people can coolly you know, welcome the extinction of a large population of an endangered species. I, I, I really wonder if our descendants um, one day will ask, oh, these guys had a thousand endangered apes in the US and they decided for their welfare to let them age and become geriatric. So I, I would actually think it would make a lot of sense for the well-being of these chimps to allow very limited breeding so that there is a young generation around the, the geriatrics. Bill, uh, what's your vision in the future? I, yeah, I, I tend to agree with Pascal to some extent. I, I, I do think that, you know, there are a lot of chimps in captivity that are owned by NIH, managed by NIH, and, and that, that colony is going to, to dwindle. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that, um, just through attrition and, and other kinds of things. But I, I hope in the future uh, that we have a relatively large, sustainable uh, colony of chimps in optimal uh, housing settings. We have breeding. We have something that resembles both the social system and physical environment of of the wild. And I really hope that we can get a much larger infusion of research support from NSF, NIH, and the private sector in studying uh, chimpanzees in the future because, as I said earlier, I think in my view there's, you know, much more interest now than there was 20 years ago in, in mm. people doing research with chimpanzees and I, and I think that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be optimistic about that. All right. Well, uh, Brian, Pascal, and Bill, I thank you so much for taking the time to discuss it. It's a tricky topic. It's a nuanced topic. Um, for anyone viewing, the chat will remain archived on the page if you want to read it, uh, watch it later.
And next week, there will be a chat on June 6th about what it will take to get humans to Mars with uh, Buzz Aldrin. Thank you, uh, three, so much for joining in. Thank you. Thanks, all. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.